Hello everyone, it is late at night in Manila, but we are gathered here today to talk about the most important pressing issue. Season 2 is ending, <laughs> and we are going to come up with another clickbaity basic pitch tier list. Let's go. No, I'm Lance, and and I'm joined today by... I'm Patrick, uh, the intern. Yep. Oh yeah, the great Patrick Mandapat, who... <laughs> Is our legendary ogre Ma tribe player who is joining me on stream for the first time? I believe. Have we ever had a stream together before? Or sorry, recording together before? Together, no. But oh I think, damn, I think we did. I I think when we used to do a tabletop simulator live streams, that's I think that, that was the last time I joined the stream. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. So yeah. this is exciting because. Patrick and I have been playing a lot of season two, Galician Champions, and to the point that I I love this season. I think it's my favorite one among all of the ones that GW has released. But I'm kind of glad to see it go, so we can try something different. Yeah, we're going into the magic meta apparently, and Mark yeah. is not as excited <laughs> with that with oh. compared to like this season. But we'll see. Dude, I'm... We're gonna get our asses kicked so much. So for background, I play Iron Jaws and Patrick plays Ogre Ma Tribes, and neither of them have particularly flattering spellcasters yeah. foot. So every time we're gonna have a locust walk up to the objective, we'll get shot off by some Lumineth brick. <laughs> it's gonna be great. I love it. But we're not gonna talk about that now. Today we're about Galician champions. Um as I said, I think this season was a lot more intricate and a lot more interesting than the previous ones. The first one was Monster Mash. Then we had Galician Veterans. It was pretending to be about foot troops, but it was really about bounty hunters. And then we have this Galician Champion meta where you can't shoot the heroes directly due to key, of, key to victory. And there were a lot of different objectives and battle tactics that could only be achieved by the heroes. I don't think it's really perfect because a lot of the battle tactics Recycled. couldn't even be done in most of the battle plans. Yeah. So there were a lot of very weird situations. And we are discussing this prior to knowing all of the rules for Season 3. So we're only going to, to, to establish, to put, to put up a little bit of a scope to this. Uh, Patrick and I are going to be talking about the past few, the past six months. And I think the tier list has considerably changed from last year because the past six months saw the release of so many different battle tomes. And, a lot, and I think the consensus is that the battle tomes for the past six months have a very different power level compared to all the, the ones that came before it. Yeah. The, the number of the battle tomes that, are com that have been coming out is a lot more frequent than the one from the previous uh, seasons. Or, uh, yeah, the GHB, previous GHBs. And then you can definitely tell that some of the armies that just came out seems to be, be uh, seems to be really good comparing it to what we had last year all right so with that being said let's get on to why we think that and where we're going with this so what are we what's the first on the list Pat uh, so the first on the list uh, so we're gonna go by uh, Grand Alliance and then it's gonna be by name so we're starting with order uh, we have cities of Sigmar all right, so instead oh, of doing wait. the usual, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go. yeah, you can you can explain our our, our tier list. So it's not from like yeah. the usual S tier to like Gets tier, and all that. Even though Gets no longer in the Gets tier, <laughs> it's its own. Uh, Gets tier means tier. something completely <laughs> it's different. Com it's now. like completely upside down. <laughs> yeah, sure. Spoiler alert. Yeah. So instead, we're arranging it by what we think each arm. You know, we're gonna arrange it by if an army expects to go five zero in a tournament given the current meta. Four one three two two three one four zero five, and I think that it's also possible for none of the for for one of the categories to not even be filled up. You know. All right, so we are cutting back because we realize that Patrick, having both the tier list and OBS, is not <laughs> conducive for recording. So now I am in charge of the tier list. All this power is now mine, and because of that, it's no longer in the order we decided earlier. It's no longer by Grand Alliance. It's by whatever order the tier list maker gave us instead of going from s rank a rank and etc we're going with what we think is uh 
is a an army you can expect to get a 5-0 in the tournament, a 4-1, 3-2, 2-3, 1-4, and an 0-5. There's a possibility that we think that none a, a certain rank or category may not be filled. And I think that's okay. Not not everything needs to be skewed in that sense. I think this is this also grounds the philosophy of the tier list into a certain set of expectations and what we think might be useful. Like if you are playing XYZ army, maybe going three two means that you're playing it better than normal or playing it average, I guess. So we're gonna try going with this kind of philosophy. We're going to are we going to average out the uh the sub factions that will be on the tier list, like for example, with like Soul Blight or Legion, or with Soul Blight to Avengory, or will we be picking the best, the potentially best sub faction and put that on the tier list? I think the be- healthiest thing to do is to get the best of each sub faction. Okay. Uh, of each faction, I mean, because. If you're playing a certain faction, we we need to rate this tier list by potential. That's fair. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's get started with this one. Any other questions, though? No. Good. All right. Let's start with something very easy. I don't even need to go by order of this. Let's look at character and overlords. Where would you put these guys? I have no clue. But they have been all right doing some reps in. Uh, we have we're playing currently at a tournament where doing quite well actually even with the so-called uh, meme list with the gun hauler spam uh, so far it's been doing quite alright even with the meme yeah, I can so, even imagine like the thunderers that they've been talking about right so for context um, the person who is piloting this list is Kron who's apparently this legendary KO admiral and he brought a 10 gun hauler list and he's basically shredding through a lot of the competition from my understanding Upon looking at the book for KO, however, I think that my understanding from what both the players in from Manila and the players on Discord say, KO seems to be a bit overtuned, but more on the Thunderer side. So they just have so much rend and so much damage and so much burst that they're able to tear through most of the competition, save for a few hard counters. I think that if you are a Caradron Overlord player and you have all you know you have all these kinds of toys that let you play a very different game this is for you uh the battle plans that are in the current ghb in season two also i think favor ko quite a bit especially with uh, um, a lot of them being uh, uh, sorry there there are kinds of missions where the objectives are relatively spread out so you you can basically move in shoot isolated units and then just take the objective. Just kill an entire army before they can before react. just sweeping the game. Yeah, yeah, before they can react or sweep. And a double turn from KO, I think, is the deadliest thing, matched only by ogres. I think. Oh yeah, you saw you saw you saw that happen <laughs> the other day, yeah. and it was very brutal. Yeah, we saw KO double turn. And it's pretty nuts. I think that as of right now, if you're playing Carriage on Overlords in season two. You are S tier. Your battle tactics are solid. You have a lot of synergies with the battle tactics in the current season, especially since you have a lot of small foot heroes. Uh, I, to my understanding, United Offense is pretty easy to do. Yeah. And yeah, I generally don't really care about battle tactics all that much. Sometimes I see KO players completely ignore the rules, play by their own rules, and just try to kill an army by turn three and win. Yeah. And just fly high to whatever objective <laughs> is out of reach okay. at that point. Yeah. So yeah, I'm gonna put this firmly on S tier to set the tone for the for the rest of the thing. Yeah. All right. Let's pick another one. Let's pick something that you're more familiar with, Patriku. So Black Grave Lords. So Where do you think this should go? Ah, uh, it's. Well, we all know uh, with the current FAQ, I think they're still re- in a really really good place. Uh, mm-hmm. I haven't seen a lot of games with uh, the new update, but they seem to be still doing well. The changes with Neferata and the uh, what else did they change? Uh, the her spells uh, with deployment and the dark mist spell. I think it's still good. Uh, it's a lot more, I would say, corrected. I think it would it especially dark mist. It, I think it's it's been ignored for a lot of years and they've only noticed now that oh 
having a vampire or dark blood knights on a two plus save is kind of broken. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's crazy. Yeah, it's ethereal. It's it's an ethereal that you can improve. It used to be an ethereal that could be improved, but not, but not made worse, right? Yeah. So yeah, with, and that janky yeah. as hell. Yeah. So with the new one, kind of makes more sense. Uh, the changes that they made, but I still think it's a really strong list. Uh, it's a really strong sub faction uh, with Virkos, the Legion of Night, and Avengori. I think they're also in a good place. Not definitely as strong compared to Legion of Night, but a uh, Legion of Blood. But uh, they're still pretty good, uh, especially with Virkos. I think they're very fun to play, very competitive. It's really good. Uh, if I were to put them on a tier list, personally, I think they. If you speak specifically play legion of blood it, it would still be a 5-0 with the okay. other sub fashion it would be a possibly a 4-1 but with a good potential of a 5-0 as well right so i think that attrition specifically has a hard time in this season especially with the tools being given to other factions like negating ward saves and being able to shred through the, the amount of damage that has come out in this season is so much higher than before, but Soulblight is the exception in my opinion. They can, they can out attrition anyone by recycling units and also having their heroes heal whenever they deal massive amounts of damage. Not to mention having the Vamp Lord be able to get Ethereal on his armor, even with other spell right as an artifact. Yeah, I would actually, I actually think that given both the prominence of Soulblight in the local meta and the metas abroad, you know. Even post FAQ, I would put Soulblight S uh, on five O, even beyond KO. Really? Yeah. Just just because I, of the attrition and the, I think zombies are still pretty nuts. They're they're very, they're especially with Dark Mist. <laughs> really no. Uh, um. Yes. And I think that Soulblight Grave Lords are able to gum up the board in a way that no one else can. Being able to come back from the dead three inches away from enemies lets you basically retake an objective on a, on a good die roll. And you also have so much chaff that key to victory is very easy to pull off. And protecting your heroes is very easy right now. Yeah, especially with... Uh, I think it's, all, it's, it's been good before. It's a lot more consistent now. Uh, especially with the new thing that they're trying to do with, where... Returning units come back uh, outside of three instead of like the usual outside of nine. Yeah, it's nuts. Yeah, it's it's been really good. Hopefully, like with the other ones, the new books that'll be coming out for next year or with the new moving forward, it will probably be the same flow with the one we have here. Yeah. So, yeah. So soul blight, Caradron overlord, starting a little strong. All right. Let's pick something that's a bit more. <laughs> Random. Let's go with Close Stormcast. Eyes. All right, oh. we have a friend who plays Stormcast Eternals, and I think his major opinion is that for the GT, in order to prepare for it, what he did was he asked Patrick if he could borrow his Soulblight <laughs> army instead. So that's, yeah. so that's the local Stormcast player meta: borrow Soulblight. So, what do you think, though, Pat? You've played against uh, JP's Stormcast a lot more than I have. Where do you think they stand in this meta? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, our Stormcast, uh, Stormcast player friend, uh, he hasn't played for Season 2. He played in Season 1. Uh, personally, I think he did really well. With Season 2, he has not played. I haven't played with a, with a Stormcast player, actually, with uh, this season. So, with I think with the, I think they have they they probably have uh, a good a better time compared to some specific armies because of. Galician champions. They just have so many that you can pick the Relictor, the Imperitant. Uh, they don't really have a lot of unique uh, characters that are strong. Maybe maybe Krondis, but uh, t talking about Galician champions, they might be in a better place. Uh, the Raptors and uh, I think the Fulminators are still what they are. Uh, even with the nerf, uh, it definitely made them a lot worse than previously. Uh, I think. I th oh, sorry. You. No, no, sorry. You think you you were, you, you said oh, no, that no, sentence? No, no I didn't. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. Sorry, you want to go? Go ahead. No, no, I don't. 
All right, all right. We're playing. We're 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 getting into our chemistry here. So, I also think that them nerfing Arcane Tome for Relictor is kind of big. No longer being able to have Relictor plus Arcane Tome on the same model. It killed, not killed, but it made a lot of builds kind of inconvenient. Yeah, because you used to have a two in one, and you and early in the season you could you used to be able to protect them with your chaff. But Stormcast, I think, is embodied more by Alpha Strike than any kind of grindy attrition. And I think Alpha Strike has been toned down because a lot of the armies that are very strong right now have a lot more wound density, right? You're seeing Gits, you're seeing Fire Slayers, you're seeing Soulbite Grave Lords. And you have like Caradron Overlords, which are kind of elusive. You also have Beasts of Chaos, which ignore Alpha Strike altogether if you're playing it properly, I guess. Yeah. So. I would personally put Stormcast at 3-2 right now because I can see them winning three matchups and then maybe losing at rounds four and five once they're starting to hit the S tier because a lot of the S tier armies or the, a lot of the 4 1 and 5 0 armies, in my opinion, have good matchups against Stormcast. Yeah, with the minus one to hit, I think personally think that Stormcast doesn't have as good as an attrition uh, compared to like Soul Blight, Gits. Uh, even corn, I think. Uh, so they're gonna have a tough time with that, especially having units that only, only specific units that are really strong, and then everything else, uh, as in a competitive setting, you wouldn't consider as much. Really, make Cox the ability for list creation with Stormcast because it's it's. Since this, the new season and the one previously, uh, Fulminators, Raptors, they've always been like the top pick with the Relictor, with the Arcane Tome and the Priest Translocation. So it's, it, I, I hope coming into the next uh, GHB, uh, not, not uh, the next uh, edition, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. it would really make uh, give the internal balance to Stormcast a lot better than they had previously. Agreed. Also, their battle tactics suck. So yeah, they, they are the, 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 one of the tomes with one of the worst aged battle tactics compared to all the others, which are inconvenient. You have some that's literally stand on an objective with two different types of unit types, and you got it. Congrats, you're a genius. So yeah, Stormcast is 3-2. I think we can agree on that. Not necessarily 2-3. So that's a lot of tools. Still, Alpha Strike, double double turning on alpha strike still really strong yeah the units they have is really good just you don't have a lot of options even though you have a numerous uh number of mo units in stormcast you're just stuck with a few units that are really really good so yeah okay so i'm gonna pick something that i'm a little familiar with iron jaws, iron jaws. Right, so it says Orc Warclans here, but this is the image we chose for Iron Jaws. We're going to explain which image goes where. It's not always the clearest, but, you know, if you're listening to this like a podcast, you'll kind of understand where we're coming from. So I'm going to start talking about my army. I think Iron Jaws is, is one of those armies that's easy to pick up, but has a very high ceiling. And they have a lot of tools that can deal with... <clears throat> I personally feel like Iron Jaws has an okay matchup against... Corn because of smashing and bashing. Cause a lot of corn has a lot of screens, a lot of very light units, and it depends on who gets to jump on who. But it's a faster army and does not play well into a lot of the high tiers, unfortunately. I think that Iron Jaw still has a very bad matchup against Lumineth and Disciples of Zinch. Every once in a while it gets kind of annoyed by Daughters of Cain. And I don't think they have a solid shot against Soul Black Grave Lords. Last time, I think Iron Jaws had a pretty good matchup against them, but with the current state of things, it's not as good. The Mega Boss on foot is the star of the show, this this edition. Um, there's a lot less people taking Maw Crushers because 18 wounds and a 3-up save is no longer, it's not nearly as efficient as just getting the reinforced Gore Gruntas, since there's a higher proliferation of like damage mortal wounds, in the, mortal wounds, you need more woundage in the army for this to work. I think that Iron Jaws doesn't have great battle tactics either. I don't think it's aged particularly well. And considering everything else you'd see in the normal scene, I would put Iron Jaws at 3 2 under Stormcast. Yeah, I think that's a good place for them to be. And they're not. Uh, the, 
the the tier list could change depending on what we see in the in the coming uh, uh, milestones that we're gonna be talking about. But I think they they stand in a good three two right now with what we have. Yeah, I I can basically come up with all the other four ones and five O's I predict that can just run them to the ground, and unfortunately that's where we're at. Yeah, they definitely. Okay. The, 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 I can't yeah. wait for the mod run. <laughs> Finally, the a, new unit. <laughs> a new unit. A new unit. It's just it's just another one. Well, it's a new hero or hero edition. If we're gonna have like another big mobile hero that can issue multiple commands that can keep up with Gorgrunt, that's gonna be amazing. Yeah. I feel. Because right now we have the Maw Crusher, and I love it. It's my favorite model in the game. But I think that it is expensive for what it does and how fragile it is, given the tools that other armies have right now. Yeah, it's very. It's, I think Our it's turn. a very simple uh, war school that they have. Yeah. Also, the loss of bounty hunters. Rest in peace. <laughs> but yeah. All right. Next. I'd left Deepkin. I didn't, we I, haven't seen them even in the yeah, international scene. I don't think I've seen a lot of uh, IDK coming in. Uh, yeah. Um, I think that Idenet Deepkin is one of those armies that is very good at protecting yourself from Alpha Strike and shooting because you get to position around that. But the units, even after several point decreases, I feel that their units are still overcosted for what they do. Not being able, um, not being able to set the pace as much this edition, unfortunately. I think their their lack of mortal wound output stops them from being consistent. They have a lot of volume, and that's great. They have a lot of momentum, but they have a hard time maintaining board presence. I think Morphan is is good. I think Eel Spam is has potential, but it doesn't really stand. Much stand up much to a lot of the mortal wounds we see higher up. I personally think that Aideneth Deepkin, while it's very fun, complex, and potentially powerful, is a 2 3 army because you need to work so hard just to get a, an ounce of efficiency out of them. Yeah, I, I have to agree with that. And with, I think, with some of the war schools, I don't think they have a lot of good. Um, Galician champions that are particularly being used. So yes. I'm not sure if the Thrallmaster is a Galician champion. He is, but he's not someone you want to do strike at the opening with. Yeah, it's it's not it's not as efficient as with the restriction of uh, some battle tax being given to Galician champions. I think he's the or Isha and Sol Tidecaster would be the two, but the other one would be on deep strike. So it's not as uh, consistent with uh, some of the other battle tactics that we have. Yeah, uh, their game plan is pretty fragile. Their battle tactics are mediocre, and they just need to work us. They need to work way harder. Just having bodies on the board. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's yeah. go with another. Oh, sorry. You have, do you have something else to add? Uh no. Uh, well, I guess I'm I'm just hoping for the next season. It, it gives the magic a lot of focus. So hopefully, oh wait, not even because because <laughs> the, hmm? the 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 storm. What do you call that? No, uh, the aspect of the sea. Idolon. No, aspect, aspect of the, of the sea, sea. Yeah. No, it doesn't matter because he's over the over the the, the wound count limit, so, right? Yeah, to be a locust. Yeah. Never mind. Carry on. <laughs> yeah, I think the advantage of the that Idolon is that he can unbind a bunch of stuff, but. Not, I don't know. Spellcasting for Idenef is very weird. Yeah, it's a lot of good spells though. I kind of enjoy their. Uh, well, no, it's a war. It's a war school, but the D three minus one save. Okay, yeah. that's fair. Anything else for anything else you want to add? Because I've said my piece. No, uh, I think I've, I kind of think they they could also be a one four, but let's put oh, them okay. two three for for now. I think just yeah. in case we see the other ones. Yeah, normally what happens is we, at the end of it, if something looks wrong, we make last second adjustments and, you know, ask you guys for your comments and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, um, let's move on to Disciples of Zinch. Where do you think they are? Where did you think they were at in the current season? In the current season? 
Um, yeah, season two. Because I know they're going to be really good next season. Oh, yeah. I, I suspect. Unless there's a Witch Hunter Core Battalion that comes out, which, is, yeah, <laughs> which I would love, but Plus one they would damage. hate. Plus uh, one damage? Plus <laughs> guys with <damage>. five wounds. <laughs> uh, I think I think they're they're good 5 0, uh, but I would I think I'd put them in a 4 1. Uh, even even though we we just had yeah I think I think with a four one I think it's a good place to be and they could be in five zero but I think they're in four one because of just their Galician champion options and pink horse still being pink horse it can still surprise you if you fight them very yeah. uh, just occasionally uh, spell casting is still really really good really strong. Uh, we usually see now these days uh cron spine being included in the list so there's also that uh yeah the very strong match very high mortal wound damage output and then their staying power is just really good with the pink horrors okay i think that um guild of summoners is the prominent archetype right now for disciples of siege we saw this in their local meta in the recent gt piloted by carlos zamora he brought it to victory with a 4-1 win because he could not deal the cons consistent damage against particularly tanky opponents i personally would put disciples of siege at 4-1 rather than 5-0 because i think that there are some very hard counters to siege as of right now yeah with um okay I guess with I yes so sorry go oh uh, particularly I think some some a, a particular battle tome here uh, like corn I think corn is a really yeah. good counter with uh, Zinch right now with their new update yeah. yeah yeah I I also think that fire slayers which is very good with their battlesmith and null, um, the null artifact that negates spell that gives spell wards on a four plus is very consistent. What Zinch has a, has a really big advantage this season is that most of their kill options are not shooting attacks. So they can bypass key to victory and just snipe enemy heroes if they felt like it. But that's also a big risk. The player person playing Zinch has to be extremely deliberate in their decision making because by targeting small heroes, you are basically removing a lot of the damage output that you have. Because yeah. the damage is still kind of swingy. Yeah, but d6 uh multiple dice every six or four plus is a mortal wound so it's not as consistent but yeah yeah so yeah i would put disciples of zinjan 4-1 they're good but i think they don't check very well again on the other stuff in this list yeah. all right let's go with something else bone splitters so bone splitters was an army that was doing that did extremely well in the galician veteran era this because bounty hunters on pigs was very strong however when they in, when they increased the points of the stabas and the boar and the Wurgog prophet and a bunch of other stuff bone splitters became extremely hard to play in fact they have almost no meta representation at all and despite assuming that they'd have a lot of galician champions and them being efficient them losing bounty hunters actually really screwed with the amount of damage they could do and board presence they can maintain. Yeah, it, it just shows how big uh, a bump to their damage would actually help them. But then again, mm -hmm. th they're known for their bo volume, so increasing that damage can be very dangerous uh, yeah. if they, they were given that opportunity. And yeah, we can see even from the previous uh, season how they did. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to put Bone Splitters at a one four. Yeah, the War God Prophet's still my favorite model from th that line, though. It's a really well written War Scroll, yeah. but it is definitely showing its age, and it's not keeping up with the meta as much. There's just so much stuff that can out attrition Bone Splitters right now, and can burst through them because they have no recursion at all. They have a once per turn, once per game, like combat phase for a board. Wow, that protects them. But there's almost there's so much more shooting now and ways to deal with your stuff outside of combat phase. Yeah. So being able to control for that is not as impressive. Yeah. Right. Oh. Let's go with another one. Um, Blades of corn. So I brought this to a international 
tabletop tournament held or run by Warhammer recently. And I did not exactly make all the best picks for what to put in my list. I think I did. I didn't try Unfettered Fury, and honestly, Unfettered Fury is really good. I think Korn is the most dominant faction in the game as of right now. They have a 5-up ward save against all damage that's beyond 8 inches, so that screws with shooting. They have a 5-up spell ward on top of that, so that screws with magic. And they have this ability called Murderlust, which is one blood type that allows them to move in the hero phase to prevent and to, to um, engage enemies before their own movement phase, which can deny a lot of space and battle tactics. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I think they're really strong right now. Like, with the new magic meta coming in, even previously the the new GHB uh, the season at the moment, they're really good counters to a lot of things. Like, with even with KO, um, having a five up ward against you if you're outside of eight of enemy units, that's really good. Uh, if you're if you're fighting magic army, then you have a five up. Spell ignore, and then it gives you a blood tithe point, which can be really good for you. And then when it comes to melee, you have murder lust, which gives you the pile in to prevent the opponent's army to actually charge, which can cock some army like fulminators, uh, stone horns. And then you're not really bad at the melee department as well with your uh, insatiate rage, uh, scar brand uh, being really, really good right now with the new update. So, I think they're a really good mobility army. They're not particularly the yeah. best at uh, hand-to-hand combat, or they don't even have range. A lot of range attacks, but your mo- your moving options, your uh, the way you control the board, is what makes uh, corn really strong right now. Yeah, fighting in the hero phase is an option. Summoning a brass beater out of nowhere to kill your opponents, countering a spell that could possibly end the game. All these things are just nuts. Corn has so many options, and I think this is a high floor army. You have to really put in the time to learn how corn works. You could go for boom thirsters, insensate rage, but it's not going to be consistent in a tournament for you because you need to rely on rolling those sixes. Scar Brand is really good right now. People say it's a nerf, but I disagree because they made him far more consistent with how often he gets activated full strength. And the stats on a broad show, and I kind of agree with them. I think Korn, having lots of bodies on the board, um, swingy, but relatively consistent hammers, and expendable anvils, should go in a 5-0 bracket. Yeah. I think I'm putting them at the very top. Yeah. They're really strong. I I think they should be nerfed, honestly. Uh, Well... Yeah, maybe some. Personally, Murderlust m- might be yeah. the first thing that they should adjust quite a bit. Uh, maybe yeah. one model or one blood type per unit that you move. So, But that's just um, me. <laughs> no, I agree. I think Murderlust should just be targeting one unit. I also think that Blood Warrior should increase by 20 points because it's 190 for a 3-up save with 20 wounds right now. That's a bit much. Yeah, but... They, I think they're even stronger than the Vindictors of Stormcast. Oh, they, um, they are. I think that they are. The, and them dying up, fighting upon death with murder rolls is even better than the exp- like literal lightning explosions coming yeah. from like immortal demigod warriors. Yeah. So I think they're got. They, I think we're gonna see Stormcast have an improved version of that in fourth edition. But only time will really tell. As of right now, if you're into the Blood God, if you're a servant of Corn, you are. You're in a great place right now. You have options to just win tournaments and stuff. Unfeathered Fury, Scar Brand all the way. All right, next. Let's look at something that's a little bit um, different. Uh, Nurgle. What do you think of Maggot and Nurgle? 5-0, no, (laughs) just kidding. (laughs) So for people who don't know, if you're from Manila, you would know that over the past year, Based on the um, the realm of beasts meta and the Galician veterans meta, our friend Nico Nico Cavada had been dominating the field and had a hundred percent win rate. And as of the recent G- GT, he actually lost his first game, which is insane. So for an entire year, ironically post pandemic, like 
Nurgle has been dominating the Manila and has had really good success in previous seasons. But you joked about them being five zero, but took it back. Why do you? Why yeah. did you take it back, Patrick? Yeah, no. Uh, I think I personally think that uh, it's just the player itself that's really good because personally, yeah. with uh, the books that came out uh, and with how a lot of the new books even have uh, anti wards now, yep. so it really cocks Nurgle since they're specially being tanky and then removing that aspect from their uh, arsenal really, uh, really, really hurts them. So if I were to put them on a uh, tier list, I'd probably put them at, uh, I'd put them at a a 4-1 or a very high 3-2 with, just based on, just based on my experience. Hmm. Uh, yeah, the, the flies, right. the fly spam is still really good. Yep. Uh, the plague, the, uh, the plague bearers are are good. You have uh, rancid visitations for uh, when you're fighting night hunt or any uh, horde armies, which can help you. But the, some armies just the anti ward says or being able to out summon um, Nurgle can really hurt them. I agree. I think also that a lot of the battle plans right now with spread out objectives gives Nurgle a run for its money because it's a small model count army. Missions like Jaws, Ours for the Taking, uh, missions with the f uh, the flank objectives. Uh, what was that one again? It's uh, position over power. Position over power. Uh, I think missions like that give Nurgle a bit of a hard time because they have a hard time spreading their army out. I would put Nurgle. I agree with you. I think Nurgle's either a low four one or a high three two, and we have a bias because the local Nurgle player that we know, Nico, is really good at, at Nurgle. So let's put him at the bottom low four one for now, and then change our mind later in yeah. case you know something pops up. Yeah. All right. Popping up next is Beasts of Chaos. Oh, uh, for 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 Nurgle. Uh, do you have Yo, any? Uh, do you have any um, sub faction in mind that? could get the 4-1. Oh, one of the things that I love about Nurgle is that any of the sub -fact I've seen every sub-faction under Nurgle have some representation in online stats. Mm -hmm. I My personal bet is still Drowned, Drowned Men. Men. Yep. But I think with the way the mission the battle plans are this season, overextending and throwing your flies across the field with a point increase to 250 per two models is very risky. And it can lead you to high success and giving you high differential wins, but it also means that your, if your opponent gets favorable priority against such a risky play, and they have ways to negate wards, you're dead. Yeah. So, a lot of people are going for the summoning build just so they can go with attri out attritioning their opponents. So droning guard is an is an option, I guess. But that's the nice thing about Mer Nurgle. I think it has really good internal balance. Oh yeah, yeah. As a book, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah, so not too much of a not, not too much of a worry, yeah. right? So, beast of chaos. What do you think? Ooh. I have, I've only fought I think one beast of chaos. <laughs> the the person I talked to, oh, we we were only like eight players, and then uh, I couldn't really uh, find. I couldn't place where they are in the meta with my experience. Uh, but with what they were able to do during my match, I think they're a really good 4-1 uh, army. Personally, I think they're better than Nurgle just because of their ability to deal mortal wounds with the rend, uh, with the rend of the addition from their uh, terrain feature um, and the easy grand strategy of protecting just the Herdstone really gives them um, quite the edge compared to the other books uh, that we have mm -hmm. that don't have that uh, yeah. ability to consistently get a grand strategy or a battle tactic. And just okay. uh, what I call Bulgors is just insanely good still <laughs> right now. Yeah, Bulgors are nuts. Sixes to hit are mortal wounds automatically. It's kind of nuts. I think that Beasts of Chaos is an extremely high floor army. 
in that it's really hard to play. You need to be very intelligent in playing this army. You can't just go willy nilly or you get punished hard because you're committing your entire army by turn one. <coughs> you can keep your army hidden, and armies that employ range damage or like to screen will have a hard time. I think in. I don't remember where I heard it, but in AOS Worlds, there are people who would specifically pair Beasts of Chaos with Seraphon in order to counter them. Just so, so you're not affected by magic, and then you can shoot the heroes with um, the. What do you call that? Galician sharpshooters? The ra- yeah, the raiders, yeah. Yeah, yeah with the raiders uh, being able to control with the heroic action, making the hero move to a better location where you can shoot them really makes them really good against certain armies. Yeah, but they're very swingy and a lot of bad things can happen if your opponent knows how knows the game plan and has a specific way around it. I would actually put them on high three twos, low four ones. Yeah. Well personally. Mm-hmm. I see them having a difficult time against Soul Blight, KO and Korn. I see them beating Zinch. I see them doing okay mm-hmm. against Maggotkin, out positioning them for sure. But yeah, uh, for now let's put them. I, I like where you put them. Let's put them above Maggotkin. Do, do for you now have a specific um, subfaction? subfaction? Yeah. Um, the All Herd, I think, and Gave Spawn are the ones that are prominent. I haven't never seen the Chaos Spawn build work. Actually, no. I've seen it work on in stats. I haven't seen it in person. I think they have a lot of interesting builds. I kind of hope that Quake gets a. Get some spot spotlight. Maybe next season when all the wizards are popping up, you're gonna suddenly see a bunch of Cygors. Yeah. Four Cygor build where your opponent takes four mortal wounds every time they cast a spell. <laughs> yeah. That would be super fucking, super freaking dumb. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Um. Beast of Chaos four one for now. I think it is ironically the weakest of the new books that have come out in the past six months, but it's still really good. Yeah. Completely different design change. Weaker than its previous incarnation, which is rare. Oh, I, I haven't fought with the previous. Uh, oh, the previous incarnation, yeah. one LDO. The previous incarnation is broken in half. <laughs> it is nuts, buddy. Okay, so let's go into something else that we are. Okay, right, you've been playing a lot of OBR, also <laughs> Reaper. Where do you, where do, you, where do you think it stands? Ah, uh, um, I think. If I were to give them a score, uh, the specific sub-fashion, I think, would be uh, Mortis Praetorians because of Catacross uh, having, and then some people do the Catacross plus Arcan build uh, with yeah. the magic, with the buffs that, that Catacross gives. But with the new, this is post um, mm, FAQ. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so. Uh, Back then, when um, uh, it used to lean with uh, a lot more volume in their uh, models, now they're leaning towards the more elite uh, lists. So the stalkers, more uh, more discard and uh, harbinger harbingers. So oh, you got it right. Harbingers was correct. Oh, harbingers, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you got it. Yeah, yeah. oh, it's okay. Yeah. So it's, uh, har- yeah, so they're leaning more towards that. I. Th- think but comparing it to soul blight corn uh the new books that uh, that it came out with i think uh it's it no uh, it's an overall improvement from the previous one so if i were to put them i'd yeah. probably put them in it uh put them in a three two because they're, they're really strong with their options of the command abilities that they can do um they're a lot more versatile the increased Speed is still the same, bludgeon is still the same, but being able to have nine command points, being able to uh, do commands that are generally they were unable to before, like all out defense, rally, oh yeah, and all that. So no, they fixed it so much. Yeah, and yeah, they they kind of fall off later in the game since they have less units, but their goal is to make a huge impact from the start, and then. Hopefully by the end of the game they dominate they dominate enough they score well enough or outnumber you uh, on the field. So if I were to put them 
I put him a three two, definitely higher than Stormcast because, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I actually, I personally think OBR is a four one, uh-huh. but let's put him in three two for now and think about it for a sec. Um, I actually think the strongest sub faction for o- OBR is Null Myriad, because and of because of the spell ward, the two plus spell ward is nuts. It j- basically shuts down entire armies. <laughs> And knowing that someone else is bringing OBR Nell Myriad to a tournament immediately completely counters Seraphon and Disciples of Zinj. Yeah, definitely. Like a lot of the top armies are magic based, so I guess having Nell Myriad as your sub faction is really beneficial. Yeah, uh, they, they they right now though they don't have a hard, they have a hard time controlling space because Mortec Guard are not as favorable as Immortus right now. So, and yeah. and I feel that this army is hard to play. You have to be extremely deliberate with your elite units. Yeah. But the overhaul was really good for them because in last tier list, we Nico and I agreed that OBR was the D tier army, <laughs> and they they needed an overhaul because they had access to so few command abilities that were set, that the, the third edition was designed around, right? Mm-hmm. But now they do. They have so many command abilities. They can retreat and charge. I actually think that OBR is an army that can give corn a run for its money because it has a command ability that naturally counters Murderlust. Murderlust, yeah. And right? Yeah. It, it, it's a Swiss army knife that once you know how to play it, the potential it has is actually quite expansive. I would put it in 4-1, honestly. because Just because it, it seems to have a good match up with some of the stuff higher up on the list. Would you put it above uh, any of the lists uh, that we have? Uh, I put it above Nurgle right now. But maybe, it's just my yeah, opinion. Yeah. Maybe, maybe put put Nurgle in 3-2. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's, sorry, Nico. Sorry. We're putting Nurgles over no. in 3-2. I don't know. For me, this makes a lot more sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I All think right. that makes a lot more sense. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go for some other stuff. Something that has no bias whatsoever in this... Actually, no. We just talked about something that you're good with. So let's pick something else. Um, Night Hunt. Ooh. Um, <laughs> Weird, right? Uh, oh, before we head on, sorry, real quick. OBR mm-hmm. also has really bad Galician champions. Champion options. Anyways, next. Night they Hunt. only have two. Yeah, yeah they're, they're not... They're, they're more like loca, lo, loca, loci? Locuses? Yeah. Lo- yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. They're better next season, but yeah. mediocre this season. Okay. Yeah. Night Hunt. Night Hunt. Uh, well, they're, I think I think I think they're good. Uh, there's definitely with the new books coming out, or I think with the new, no, I I don't think with the new season, but with the new things that are coming out, I think it's a bit. Uh, tougher for them. I think they're be- they're good against some of the older books that came out before them, but with yeah. the newer books that came out after, I think they're having a hard time at the moment to score. But uh, the stats in um, some of, some of the people who won tournaments uh, internationally are starting to do well with some of them. So there might be something that uh, I'm missing here, but. I would put them in a, I put them maybe on a three two or a two three uh, um, standing. All right. So uh, the reason Night Hunt top three guy wasn't even a five zero, I think it was by nature to Lenny. It kept me. In, in, I, I remember reading a Warhammer article. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments chat, but like Night Hunt, I think is a two three army. You need to play it completely out of your mind. You cannot make mistakes with this army. And it's a Death Star army in a season with a lot of battle plans that force you to spread out in a very deliberate manner. I think Night Hunt is a 2-3. It's not very it's not very fast. It's a slow army despite it being a bunch of ghosts. It's hard to catch because you can retreat and charge. Again, making it good against Korn. But it's also extremely fragile to mortal wounds. And... While it's good that it can protect its heroes, it has a lot of very bad matchups in the higher-ups. 
Disciples of Zinch and Lumineff are examples, I think, of really bad matchups for Night Hunt. Yeah, just because of... Yeah, just, just with the mortal wound output that they have, um, being able them being able to survive... Because they're not the hardest-hitting army out there. So yeah. if you if you have something that uh, minus one to hit or uh, negating damage as much as possible, uh, they're ha- gonna have a hard time. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I would put them at two three for now. You can just make sense of it later. Is Scarlet Doom uh, still the be- the best one they have, in your opinion? Um, I don't think there is a clear best one right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I haven't. I haven't no, I, played, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I haven't played as much uh, with Night on. Uh, but they're growing. Number of players here have been growing. So hopefully. Actually, we'll... Night Hunt is extremely popular in Manila for some reason. Yeah. Like I, ridiculously so. I think it, it's the way they look. <laughs> it's just really enticing. Being able to the models are, are gorgeous. Uh, they're extremely hard to bring around. But yeah, they have they don't have the mobility to stop the alpha striking armies as consistently in these with these battle plans and deployments. They also I also feel that they lose all the high tier stuff. So I would put them in two three for now, and maybe we can revisit this once the tier list um, you know becomes more tangible or concrete. Yeah, no, I agree. All right, so let's go with another interesting one. Um. Slaves of Darkness. Slaves. Uh, slaves to Darkness. Uh, yeah. uh, with, with the, the, I think with Archeon and the rise of uh, the Serpents, the Serpents, I forgot the name of the unit. Uh, Splintered Fang. Splintered Fang. I think, yeah. I think they're good. I think they're quite fun to play against. And with, uh, with the uh, Chaos Warriors and the mobility of the Chaos Knights being a really good anvil, uh, very mobile anvil compared to the very slow moving but very uh, still very tanky Chaos Warriors. Uh, they have a strong. Uh, they have strong castings with uh, the Chaos Sorcerer, uh, with Archeon is still really good. Um, they have really good GCs as well with uh, the Chaos Lord Chaos Sorcerer, so it's a lot better for this season for them, especially with the new book that came out for them. Uh, I would put them in a, I put them in uh, in the three two. I put them in with the score of a three yeah. two. I think is Kabbalist still the the best. Um, uh, I think there are vi- there are multiple viable builds for them. Hosts is good. Cabalus and Ravager are both good. Ravagers, from my understanding, is a good hard counter to Lumineth if you build it with Archeon and Splintered Fang, because there's so many of them and it's an anti-precision tool type of build. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would put so I would with good ward saves, good all around like fundamentals. I put them at high three too. I put them above Maggotkin this season. Yeah, no, that's so, true. So, I guess my opinion for Slaves Darkness is that Mark of Nurgle is really good. And Eroding Banner is also fantastic. Charging with uh, Untamed Beasts with Corn, or charging with Knights of Corn is always good. Varengard are okay. They're not as dominant as I expected them to be, but Varengard are still cool. I think overall, what for me, what makes this I-3-2 over the others, despite kind of not having a lot of options on how to engage because it's all just melee. They don't have shooting. Is that their battle tactics are so easy? Oh yeah. Run them down. Just charge with three. Charge with three units. Fantastic. Because I have a horn blower that turns one of my die rolls into a four. I lust for power. Did your Galician champion stand an objective this turn that was previously held by your opponent? Roll an eye of the gods. It's so easy. It's like it's basically the closest thing to conquer that you're gonna ever gonna get. Yeah, I miss conquer. <laughs> I'm, I don't, I, uh, man. Be, I, season one, but season zero battle tactics were so dumb. The, they were the, so easy. The simple I took days. them for granted. The, <laughs> back in the day, ferocious um, advance monsters. Yeah, and then you also have a, another tactic where you just all you need to do is put your banner in your opponent's territory, and that's easy. Yeah. 
it's so freaking easy. And then you can have Corvus Cabal, I think, which in my opinion is the best uh, cultist unit. Just have them deep strike deep to strike. get the to get a desecrate. Yeah. So I think that if you're good at fundamentals and you know how to position really well, slaves is very strong. Yeah, you have a lot of options with uh, different marks. Uh, you can either make him very tanky or very uh, high volume of damage. So yeah, yeah, it's it's Running good charge. fun for list building. But in terms of rules of engagement, I think they lack flexibility, which is why I'm putting them in three two and not four one. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. All right, so next. Something that's a bit difficult to gauge. Dollars of Cain. Uh, they're they're tough. Um, with Marath with Marathi, right? is, uh, it's it's good, but it, but she's not as dominant as before. I think. No. N I'm not really sure why she suddenly just fell off. Well, not really fall off, but not a lot of players play um, um daughters okay. as much. I think it's with the price increase, right? That made it's them, the point like, increase is absolutely what killed them. Yeah, they lost like two to three units from point increases alone, and I think that they have okay Galician champions, I guess. But as an army spamming stalkers and then having more having Morathi make them fire twice is not as consistent anymore, considering the damage output of the newer armies and the wound density that they have. A lot of these armies have recursion and ways. To deal with Morathi and out sustain her. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With ju just just the increase itself is just really damaging to them. Um, with the less number of units, you don't even have enough options to screen. Uh, if you get charged, that's almost a guarantee. With uh, their really bad saves, to almost have them killed immediately. So it really opens them up to being uh, either double turned or being charged right after. So yeah, uh, their their game plan is so fragile. On paper, they're really really good, but with the pace of the game and the kind of reach that they have, uh, they don't they have such a hard time holding board presence. I would actually put them at low three two right now because they're still a big threat. Like uh, they still have so much volume, they can still take on IDK and Night Hunt. They would still beat Iron Jaws if they Morathi properly, but and I think they could. I don't think they can beat Stormcast in a dogfight though. I put them above Iron Jaws. Above Iron Jaws. You um, put them in what? No, no, Somewhere no. lower too, but. I, I. I wouldn't put them above Stormcast in the current state. That they're actually, in. Even I, they, I, I think. I yeah. think. I think Iron Jaws. I think personally is higher. Than higher than Daughters of Cain. Daughters of Cain. But uh, I'll uh, take those there, W's. There, there, there is. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. Shit. <laughs> uh, yeah, stroke my ego. With, with, uh, but then again, with the witch elves option, uh, being high volume, being they are squishy if, if they get charged. But if they were the one to make a charge, I think, uh, it's really good. But oh yeah, uh, with the ability to move twice with iron jaws, I think they're gonna have a hard time compared to. Uh, fight. They're gonna have a hard time fighting Iron Jaws. Uh, uh, I think I uh, know. I think Xanthar Kai, the the one where you have snakes that, that fight Fire upon death. death. Morathi and Blood Sisters is extremely hard for Iron Jaws to fight because uh, it it flips our dynamic against them, which is engage everything, and then every everything fights upon death. Then we're basically losing all units that we are fighting with. Yeah, no. Uh, and then, and then cl clearly, um, yeah, you're, you're right. Yeah. Go go back down. Go back down. I'm just going <laughs> yeah, to get. Yeah. I, hate, I, hate, I hate me sometimes too. But, but yeah, clearly they have better magic with Marathi. Uh, being able to increase rend, increase damage can be good against Iron Jaws as well. Yeah. yeah. It's, I, I, I think it's one or the other, but I think. Yeah, three two is a good number for them. Okay, we've had some long discussions. Let's let's go with an easy one. Kachow, Kachow. gets all the way up there. Gets. All right. No. Okay, I'm gonna. Oh, well, sorry. Yeah. Oh no, no, no. There you go ahead. <laughs> all right. So the, gets. 
this is the book that kickstarted everything. This is the first book that came out that was a league above everything else. And when we read this book, when we had we read the previews, our friend Christoph was going out of his freaking mind when AOS Coach was talking about it. Yeah, no, they're, they're really and good. They're really good. So in AOS Worlds, you have entire Gits armies that are really hard to touch. It's an S tier army all around. And people built lists not to beat Gits, but to lose against them less because in AOS Worlds, they use point differentials. Jaws of Mork and King's Gits, I think, are the stand like the standout sub factions. Jaws of Mark gives plus one attack on the charge for squeaks, and the King's Gits lets you roll an extra die to see if you recur your units on the four plus at the end of your turn. Yeah. No. I really love their they're just their synergies, uh the Gubapalooza yep. is just making everything really good, increasing their rend, uh being a double yeah. caster. With having a squig herd unit that you move twice in the hero that lets you move an extra time at the start to pin your opponent 36 wounds, like sorry, 72 wounds for 360 points. That if they run away, you just you know, take mortal wound on a two plus take mortal wound. And a prominent build for gets right now is to go at 19 20 points and then just take a war, take warlord and get double indomitable as a triumph. Yeah, so because sometimes you don't want to your squigs to run, sometimes yeah. you want them to run. But just enough to where uh, you still have a chance to recur them with your uh, squig herders. Yeah, and uh, for context, squig herds cannot receive command abilities, so but they can receive triumphs. Yeah, they're they hit hard. They're extremely fast. They have a lot of attrition. Uh, they're good at attritioning your opponent, and. I think it's S tier overall. I think it's a 5-0 list. If right now is a great time to practice and play Gits. I think the troll the Trogoth build is interesting. And we might see more bad snatchers and the aka the wizard build next um, uh, next season. Yeah. But as of right now, I think Gits is firmly a 5-0 type army. I'd put it under Soul Blight right now. Um, but I would put it up there. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think Soul Blight still has the better recursion. The they just uh, I think G Gits just has the really good mortal wound output and the mobility compared to Soul Blight. But with Soul Blight, with good artifacts, good heroes, especially if you put them in a fight together uh, yeah. with the terrify of a zombie lord and zombie a vampire vampire lord and zombie dragon. It can be tough for them, mm -hmm. but yeah, it, uh, yeah. I think I think that's a fair assessment with what they have, and the, they still have that random randomization of being where the moon is is where they shine the most. So you can either go, it could be it could be stuck in your deployment zone the entire game, or it could suddenly go out of the the board and then you can no get it. So it's not as perfect, but they're still really good. Yeah, I agree. Okay, next one's a doozy. Lumineth Realm Lords. Yeah. Lumineth. Um, Lumineth, they're probably... Yeah, maybe low 5-0 or high 4-1 for me. Because uh, wow. there's only one build. <laughs> Based on what I'm seeing, there's usually only one build, and it's Techless and Sentinels. There was actually a very interesting build without sentinels that was played at worlds by this guy named rune from denmark he has techless he has spirit of the mountain a bunch of wardens and he's playing emetrica mm, he uh, doesn't have any stone guard crazy oh. build and he has light of altharion too it's an insane build um i'm not entirely he has a whole write-up about it on twitter for how to play it but it's clear that while sentinels is the most straightforward path with the rise of corn you might need to come up with other ways to deal damage. Yeah, with the OB Arsenal Myriad, uh, a lot of armies are now leaning towards anti-magic as well. Yeah. Um, between Techless and Rune of Petrification, though, I think Lumineth Realm Lords is high 4-1. I, would, I wouldn't I would put it at 5-0 because it doesn't have a lot of ways to deal with the, the best armies. I think it has its struggles against Soul Blight, Corn and a particularly tanky gets build. Yeah, I, I, same with other armies. Um, 
they lose the attrition game against uh, Soul Blight most of the time with Gits. Mm-hmm. They have good mortal wounds out against them. And then with KO, uh, they have enough bodies where I think I think where well where where the Sentinels shine the most or uh Techless is that it's pinpoint damage so they can destroy one thing really good but not everything in the same turn. So with KO they don't have as the uh, they have a lot more options compared to uh, Lumineth. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that the Lumineth can beat KO because Shining Company makes Chaos shooting a lot less consistent. But I've seen builds where you put an Ordinator to give plus one and <laughs> negate that. I don't know how prominent that will be, but I would put Lumineth as a 4 1. I think that they struggle with the current. Um, with the current high wound density we see it up there and the higher tier. But I think Blumeneth is still very good. Still hard to play, but it's there. Yeah. All right. Let's go for something else. Ogre Maw Tribes. No. Uh, I think they're... For obvious reasons, you should talk about it. <laughs> I think they're a 4-1. Uh, th- 4-1, one. I would put Where? them... Where would you put them? Ugh. All biases. Ugh. All biases. Go. Put them at 5-0. <laughs> uh, uh, I would put them oh, okay, in 4-1 in above... Above... I think they're above. Mm. I think they're above OBR, but not. I don't. I th- I, th- I think with B. Uh, uh, what's that? <laughs> what? what? Beast of chaos. Beast of chaos. It could go either way. Uh, yeah. No, I think they're 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 good for one. Maybe even sometimes they they would go three two. But right now with uh, everything that's going on. With the price increase of the Iron Blaster, Underguts used to be the uh, the top sub faction for it, but now we're back to just playing Stonehorns again, uh, because of the update of, uh, with the new book, giving them three D six um, passing over units. It's really good, giving them the mobility. Yeah. yeah. So dumb. Yeah. So. Yeah. Increasing their wounds. Uh, and, yeah. And all that. I would actually put ogres above Zinge. My Zinge. opinion. Oh, we, we can put it in between. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'd put it above Beast of Chaos. I think that tournaments abroad show that Ogres are extremely consistent. I think they're actually more consistent than Beast of Chaos, to be honest. And we see a lot of prominent wins from Boulder with Boulderhead abroad. Yeah. And earlier on with Underguts, they had that kind of dominance. The Hive Tyrant... Sorry, the Hive Tyrant. <laughs> Ogre 40K. Tyrant is not... A, yeah, 40 <laughs> Yeah, putting Tyranids in the Tyranids. That's the right <laughs> way to do it. Like, I, I think that the Tyrant is solid. The Butcher is solid. They're not amazing. And I feel like Tuttle Master Tyrant is gonna is a thing. Yeah. But I, I think that uh, Ogre Maw Tribes is a 4 1 army that is extremely hard to deal with. If you do not know how to. If you don't have a way around ward saves and cannot handle the speed, Ogre Maw Tribes is, extre- is gonna run you over. Yeah, they're a lot more versatile than the old book. Personally, especially with the new battle tactics, I think a lot of the new books that came out, uh, ever since, I remember back then when we used to have a problem with, um, with, uh, what do you call this, with Daughters of Cain having very easy battle tactics. Granted, the plus one VP victory point makes it even better, but even without that, I think the what's happening with the new books tomes that are coming out uh, they're leading towards at least having one or two passive um, battle tactics that are easy to get so all yeah. Grom tribes has two they have two they either have to be everything needs to be engaged or everything needs to be not engaged at the end of the turn so it's definitely very easy for them to score uh, battle mm-hmm. tactics now uh, and then increasing the wounds and then yeah, just increasing the wounds in general for uh, Stonehorns and their monsters just really elevates them to... Makes them even a harder matchup to fight against. I agree. Yeah. All right. So, let's move on to another army. Pearl Boys. Oof. So, I, uh, I think Cruel Boys have a hard time because they need to rely on sixes to hit in order to get their most wound out but cruel boys is actually at their best under big wa and not as their own faction unfortunately dirty tricks are interesting and they're fun and they're thematic and immersive but they're not consistent they're not, they're so th- i think this would be 
they're fun, yeah, they're a fun narrative army. I don't see them being consistent in competitive. I'd put them as a four one or a one four army as of, as of right now. Higher there than, are some point bone splitters or I would put them higher than bone splitters because bone splitters right now are are, are like in, invisible. Cruel boys are interesting because they had some buffs. Like the swamp called the shaman can now give additional buffs to the poison poison, giving poison while also them. casting a spell. Yep. Uh, and I think that that is um, interesting, but yeah. the damage output is still so swingy and inconsistent. Yeah, they're very slow. Uh, they have good damage output. Uh, granted, they need to be buffed to do that, and then but they're they're slow. A lot of armies are fast, or they have ways to either magic magic you away or shoot you dead. Uh, what's what's funny to me was uh, I was watching. Uh, T Sport Network's uh, stream with Worlds teams, and apparently KO lost to Cruel Boys, and that was hilarious. That <laughs> yeah. I think uh, Grinning Blades is good against particularly uh, strong Two shooting armies. armies. Yeah, yeah, so that was surprising when I heard that. <laughs> People are all cheering no, in the chat. <laughs> no, dude, everyone loves it when Cruel Boys win because they're basically the gits right now. Yeah. <laughs> they're an army that has lots of weird tricks, synergies, and relies on a lot of jankiness and luck. And yeah, that's what Cruel Boys are. They unfortunately have not seen a lot of tournament success. Yeah. Save for like a few hipster fringe builds, I guess, or cases, which I can't name off the top of my head. But Cruel Boys is not very good. I think they're a one for army. Unfortunately, despite being a new army for season three, for edition, third edition, it's never, it's had a year, almost three years at this point, and it hasn't found its footing yet. Yeah, I, personally, I think Grinning Blades might be the, the best one for them, just because not being able to be seen or targeted outside of 12 really gives them at least a chance against uh, magic or shooting armies being able to go near them first before they, they're able to do their stuff. Agreed, though. Yeah. So... Let's go with the next puppy. Sons of Behemoth. Sons. They are... So, they're good. Uh, uh, especially, yeah. They're so good. Yeah, they're good. Unfortunately, with the new GHB, they have been ignored completely. Almost com No, actually completely. With yeah. uh, being the focus on Galician champions. And uh, even in the Galician veteran days... They weren't, there weren't any tactics that they could do uh, that were those that were uh, leaning towards that type of uh, those battle tactics so it's harder for them to score points but what they do is get objectives and they still do that really well with, uh, with King Prod being able to focus uh, on fighting monsters is really good for them I put them in a 3-2 maybe yeah, I I put them in three two. Yeah, uh, yeah. I would put them in bottom three. I would actually put them top of two three right now because the battle tactics are so hard to achieve. There's literally a mission or battle plan which is the opposite, which is which requires you to contest an objective with a GC, and they know. literally cannot do anything about that. So if like you summon a sloppy vile piper or a skull taker on that point, and ogre mop would... I mean, the sons of be my player to just rug. They're also a lot swingier now, so precision tactics are gonna be very tough for them. I'd put them at high two three, honestly. Yeah, and unfortunately, with the new uh, season coming up again, they won't be able to gain any of the abilities since it's yeah. still the same Galician champions, but only for spell casting, and they don't meet that requirement. No. So. And last year, there was a time when Suns was extremely dominant, when they would have a sixty plus seventy plus percent win rate. But as of right now, a lot of armies actually can meet the DPS check and win. Especially Slaves of Darkness. That army chops through Sons of Behemoth really fast. Yeah. Um, I think Sons of... No, Sons is still a good army overall. They're fun. They're but I don't... Fun. They're super fun. Yeah. They're, they, whoever wrote the book is a genius. But I don't think that they are... But I think that personally they're a 2-3 army. There's a lot of battle plans that work against them. There are a lot of armies and matchups that work against them. I think another argument I have for Suns being so there is that Slaves of Darkness, which for, for me personally feels like a hard counter to Suns, it is one of the most, it is the most played army in the world right now. Slaves. 
Yeah, Darkness. Slaves of Darkness. They look amazing. The models look amazing. They're, it's the mechanics aren't very hard to figure out, and they're very thematic and edgy. So I think the Slaves of Darkness being so prominent also merits Suns going two three. Yeah. Do you think uh, is Stomper Tribe the best one or or uh, Takers? I don't. I think Stomper Tribe is the best Stomper right now. Tribe. War Stompers are good because they're four hundred fifty points of pop. So being able to get a bunch of those plus the new improved Man Crushers from. Which are better than they were last edition. I think. I think um, they're solid. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fire Slayers. Um, okay, so for Fire Slayers, I personally think they are. You know what controversial? I think they're here. What? I think they're high four one. So I, why is that yeah. the case? <laughs> My argument for that is that there's one build specifically that's going around. The one that gives plus one to hit and wound for Volkite Berserkers to charge. So the build features a Battlesmith that gives a four up rally to all the units and you have a bunch of Volkite Berserkers and maybe like one unit of Enforced Hearth Guard. You also have two Flame Keepers. Flame Keeper is the unit that came out last year in the dual box, the solo mm -hmm. hero that gets um, increased power whenever a model nearby dies. Okay. Mm -hmm. So okay. you have this extremely bullshit loop where um, you have the f you have Volkite Berserkers fighting upon death, and then you have them being rallied on a four plus because of the Battlesmith. They also give a four up spell ward because of that. The um, Fire Slayers also has really good collision champions, Rune Son and Rune Father in melee with extra damage. Sorry, with extra possible chances to attack should never be underestimated. They have a lot of Doom Seekers. Um, sorry, getting back to it. Flame Keepers. Mm. Flame Keepers are good with the Volkite build because you, if five models die next to it, which reverts the die from a one to a six, it's the, how their ability works. You get to charge it during your opponent's turn. Oh, okay. That's cool. Right? Yeah. So what's kind of interesting about this, and correct me if I'm wrong, chat, is you can charge during your... It took a while for people to figure out Flame Keeper tech, but if you charge during your opponent's turn and you are targeting a unit that charged, I think you can give them strike first in combat phase. With plus one hit, plus one to wound. Okay, I can see why they're really strong. Yeah, I think that with a lot of that um, battle plans and and the really busted grand strat of just my invocation needs to be on the board. And you have no way of interacting with it unless you have a priest. I think Fire Slayers is a really strong army right now. They have lots of ways to negate damage. If you shoot them, they'll just rally, and they can protect the heroes that give them those buffs because of key to victory. So unless you have sharpshooters, you are not dislodging Fire Slayers if they are played properly. Is there a specific sub faction that that build was based on? Yes, it's the one that gives plus one hit, plus one to wound on the uh, on the Volkite Berserkers on the charge. It's so good. Like, it's not even, like... For, in my opinion, right, as of right now, it's not even close. Okay. Nice. So I put them up there. Uh, you still have to play them really well, though. It's a high-floor army. The moment you charge out of range of the Hearth Guard's ward saves, you're basically screwed. Yeah, this, they have the same problem as all fly, Fire Slayers have, which is they're slow. So if you can outmaneuver them, uh, good. But if they catch up to you, then that's, the, that's what makes them better. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about the next ones. Uh, uh, oh, Sylvaneth. Sylvaneth. Oh. Uh, so, some fashion that's been going around a lot is Oakenbrow. Oakenbrow. Yeah, focusing yep. on. Jinx. Uh, yeah. <laughs> on uh, the Tree Lord, right? Tree Lord. Tree Lord battle yep. line. Uh, Durthu being a uh, Spite Swarm Hive. Um, and. There was one more that gives um oh a battle mage battle mage plus spite swarm hive really yep, for extra for the extra charge for extra in, in in charging really guarantees you being able to have alpha strike and then strike it fade after you go back to reposition yourself so it's good it's really good right now uh, I would put them in I think I put them in three two uh, I would actually put them under ogres. But I don't know, this is my opinion, I'm just letting you know, because they have a lot of 5-0s, actually. Yeah, they do. 
uh, especially with open brow. So I yeah. don't see them as a three-two. I the problem with I have with Sylvaneth, it's not really a problem, I guess. It's they're really hard to play. You make one mistake with them, you you pile in slightly one inch away, so that you're no, no longer wholly within Nine. a tree or yeah. overgrown terrain, and you no longer have strike and fade, and you're screwed. Yeah, so it plays in a certain way where you need to play. Uh, you need to control where the uh, your enemy is going as well. Yep. Especially you, you want them to go in the particular place where you want to put your trees on, and then that's where you strike. So it's a lot. It's, it's very five head, five head uh, move when you play Sylvana, because it takes a yeah. lot of planning for yeah. I can't see them being three two considering how much tournament success they've had recently. I'd put them at four one. Yeah, sure. You can put them four one. I put them at four one because they're extremely hard to play. I put them under ogres because I think ogres are just consistent. I'd put them above Beast of Chaos because I think that Sylvaneth can handle Beast of Chaos and OBR. But it's five head to play. You need to be very you need to have great good matchup knowledge. Yeah. And your opponent, if your opponent makes a mistake, you will exploit that and completely destroy them. Well, Umbrella is also great because Tree Lords have an inherent... Uh, when I say Tree Lords, I mean Spirit of Durthu and Tree Lord Ancient. They have a built-in ability in their War Scroll to let them um, use the Spirit Paths, basically, or teleport. Yeah. So, it's a very mo It's a surprisingly mobile army that cannot take up space. Yeah, with uh, even with um, the Dryas being minus one to hit and wound, so it makes them very tanky. Uh, you can give them a five up ward with Lady of Vines or being close to a tree. So there's that. There's also uh, the War Song Revenant being really good spellcaster uh, with a lot of mortal wound output. So there's a lot of builds that you can do and have fun and really have good results with. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I think I think I don't know, do you agree Sylvan F four one under ogres? Yeah, I think I think I'm fine with putting them there. Alright, let's go to the next one. Let's go to Skaven. Skaven. Um what do you think? I'm percolating, I'm still thinking. No, I'm not really sure where to put them in. Uh they're they're good. They have good Galician champions. Um but I have really have no experience with Skaven. The last time I played Skaven was played with Skaven, against Skaven was the GD the last GD year. Last year, yeah, 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 with Dennis, right? Yeah, with Dennis. I don't really don't yeah. know where, so, the, where they are right. I don't know really where they are right now. I think Dennis. Uh, I think Dennis is a good player, and he brings the most out of Skaven. But I think on average, a Skaven army takes a lot of work to to, to ring value out of, and I would kind of put them at low three two or high two three. Because they have a lot of tools, they're very interesting. They've got a lot of Galician champion options that can retreat, and that's a huge deal upon fighting. Yeah. Right. Um, they also have uh, fight on death yeah. abilities. Fight on death. Yep. Um, Thankwall is really good spellcaster. Yep. Yep. Uh, one of the, one of the best. Yeah. But as an army, it's very fragile, and if your opponent like if a dis if your opponent's destruction and they just double, they have. You know, they slap you with a proper double turn. Skaven is a particularly fragile army against that. I think Skaven can handle shooting because they have so many models. And if they just keep bringing back slave clan rats like toward the end, they should be fine. Mm -hmm. I'd put them at bottom 3 2 right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's pick a controversial one Cities of Sigmar. I have no clue. I have no clue. I haven't seen them in a while. They've uh, been gone for a while, and I think Hollow Heart is their best um, is their best sub faction as of right now. Because Living Cities died with that FA with that Battle Scroll update that stopped them from being able to do the, the special chargey stuff. Being able to, sh uh, I think, what is it? Uh, uh, the deep strike and then move or something like that. Or yeah, yeah. I, I also don't feel like they have a lot of good Galician champions. I haven't seen them at all recently. I haven't seen them in any of the standings. I haven't seen them locally. Uh, we have like one one active Cities of Sigmar player, like BK. But I, I don't see them in the meta at all. And the way they interact with things is very basic. They've aged poorly because they're going to get a new tome soon in the Dawnbringer Crusade. I would put yeah. them at high 1-4 right now. Yeah. So I get, we can wait for the new book for them. Uh, 
They're gonna be so amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're gonna have so many new models. It's gonna be crazy, dude. Yeah. But yeah, but for now, Sinus Sigmar is uh, one four. They don't have the tools. They don't have anything unique. The Blades of Corn, Soul Blight, and any of the S tiers, and a lot of the four one armies, just do what Cities does, but better. And they just don't have anything particularly exciting. Even the um the Ar the Hurricanum, yeah, the Hurricanum, Hurricane. which is good. Get, which is normally great for sniping heroes can't snipe heroes because of the key to victory so yeah unfortunately i'm gonna have to put them here they're gonna get a battle to him soon though so if you're butt hurt by our decision well one we're just two randos on the internet you don't have to care too much <laughs> but you know city of sigmar is unfortunately not in the best place right now yeah. next he the nice with slanesh slanesh they're fun they're good um yeah. i would put them um uh, actually I don't know where to put them. They're they're somewhere in between Ooh. Korea, Kuchan. No, no. <laughs> Sorry, go. I'll, I'll they're somewhere them, between what? I'll put them somewhere in between four one and three two as well. Uh I um mm, uh, I would put them above OBR. I'm not sure about Beast of Chaos. Uh but what they're having a hard time right now was is people are starting to get how to <laughs> deal the, the trick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just just don't give it to them. Don't don't give it to temptation. Yeah, don't That's give it. it. Temptation, but hey, you want to give me the thing that I'm poking you for? No. No. How about no? So learn yeah. to say no, um, kids. <laughs> Uh, the, the 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 really crazy one though is that someone some people build eighty eight bliss barb archers and apparently that's their whole army. Yeah. So the, the what's really strong right now is the bliss barbs and then you have the, the bliss barb seekers on top of that, giving them rent two. So mm -hmm. what makes them that's what makes them really good, and being in I think, pretenders, get, get, being able to give three all out attacks to like twenty bliss. 20 to 60 bliss barbs is actually insane <laughs> oh dumb um pretenders is like the yeah you're right pretenders is the runaway sub faction i think they're high three too the highest one because when you get the games four and five after going three and oh you're gonna encounter the players with the wound density and the experience and the know-how on just saying no to the temptation dice and overpower the army. Uh, what I've seen recently, though, is that Lanesh has a lot of success allying with Bellacore. Oh, I haven't seen that. Yeah, there are quite a few lists that are good at that. Um, it's particularly good. Actually, I don't really know how to use Bellacore and Slanesh, but probably the same. Just shut down a big piece, get get extra turns to Bliss Barb Archer, poke them, and it's going to be good. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I think that wasn't as controversial as I thought it would be. Next, let's go for a doozy. Flesh Eater Quartz. Huh. Put it, I'd put them in 2 3. <laughs> yeah, I put them in 2 3 as well. Yeah. I actually put them above IDK but below Night Hunt. Which is super. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, in my opinion, but you can, you can disagree. Uh, let's talk about it. I, I think the only thing that would make me put them above Night Hunt. Well, the only reason, uh, personally, was. They have the volume to fight Night Hunt, but against other armies, I can see why they would be under Night Hunt in terms of uh, what they do. So with, uh, not really sure the up the best sub faction for right now. Is this a Grizzle Gore or is it? Uh, is I, it brother, I have no idea. I haven't seen I haven't seen Feck in a long time, but I think that Feck has the potential to take down bigger armies than it. It's just that you need to be lucky and. It's very prio relate dependent, I think, because of how fragile the army is. Yeah, you, you, uh, there are books coming out end of the year. Oh yeah, which is good. So yeah, yeah. You, you need a lot of things to go off for them to be good. You need to give them the extra attacks. Yep. You need to not be roared just so they can fight yeah. twice. So once you're roared, yeah. it's already that, that's out of the options. So, but they have really good volume. Their recursion rate is crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so being able to return uh, number of models uh, is really good. Uh, with yeah. the new unit that's, that came out, 
apparently they're considered ghouls so I was talking to uh, one of the players from Australia that I fought with in tournament uh, Marty uh, he yeah. mentioned that with ghouls you can um, with the ability of the ghoul king to summon ghouls is technically you can summon them even without putting them on the list which is interesting and then they have really That's good, annoying yeah, they have really good damage output and volume but I haven't seen them in person because they just came out I think here as well in the Philippines so uh, the jury's still out with whether they'll be good uh, in our meta here but I can see the potential of them being good and I can't wait for the next book for that one I think they're missing a consistent recursion engine because fighting fact should be fighting like an army of like very mediocre mook chaff mm. and they don't have that recursion which is unfortunate for them I put them in 2-3 as well there's a lot of potential I thought what saved mm. them before was the cron spine when it came out because it gave everything plus 1 to hit mm. uh, right yep. uh, when it receives an all attack which is huge it gives all your like 4 plus to hit units make them 3 plus and all 3's Jeez. go into 2's mm -hmm. so yeah Fek has a lot of potential it's a big brain army don't go into a tournament expecting to win straight up with Fek but it's or without putting in the work in, I mean, because you could win if you put the work in. Yeah. Okay, so next. Before we go on to the controversial new, not controversial, but the new tome, Big Wire. Big Wire. I have no clue. Where would you put that? Oh, okay. So, uh, as of right now, Big Wire is basically what Cruel Boys should be. Uh, Corpse Ripple Vulture is uh, very important, and Bolt Boys are also very important in this build. The Art Boys are the, literally usually just for screens. Mm -hmm. I would put the big, big wa above Stormcast but under Nurgle. Mm. Why? I think they have a lot of good Galician champions, Wargog Prophet being one of them. However, and they also have a battle tactic that they could do for free. So technically, they have better, better battle tactics than the rest of the Ogre, uh, the Oroch Warclan books. Um, they have a way of projecting strength outside of their border. They, they can use a mock pressure, they can use a Kragnos if for some godforsaken reason they do. Um, but being able to slow the pace of the game down, to making everything two stat two to wound is pretty big. Yeah, well, we just had a game where the Gorgrunt just basically had plus one to it and wound as well, probably round two, end of round two. So it's a really good for for Gorgrunters, and not just Gorgrunters, even um, brutes, even brutes, it makes them really good. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So yeah, I, I would put Big Wa there for now. It is not very con. I don't think it's the most controversial opinion. They got good utility. It's a slow army. It's the most. It's the least destruction of all the destruction armies because you want to slow down and slowly gather Wa points before exploding. But yeah, that's where I think they are. Um, next, let's do an easy one. The e this easy one, one is. Oh no, it's not this one. I mean, oh, where did it go? Oh, where did it go? Oh, there it is. Oh, it's there. Okay, Starborn. Um, this one's interesting because Seraphon, as of right now, Seraphon had come out, but we haven't had a lot of experience playing against them. I've seen them played a few times. Starborn is interesting because you can use a heroic action to teleport in the hero phase, and synergizing that with Croak is absurd. There are entire armies that will just get wiped by it, and armies that have not that can, can do nothing to it. It's only really being kept in check right now by, I think, Zinch and Korn. Yeah, being able to counter magic or outcast um, crow spells. Yeah. Or just spells in general. Yeah. I would actually put this under Lumineth but over DOT as of right now. It does so much. There's so much utility. There's so much spells. They increase the mortal wound output. The Seraphon book without FAQ is currently quite busted in my opinion. There are ways for it to be very consistently wipe out the enemy army on turn one. Mm-hmm. Do you think you you don't think they're a five O material? No, not with these four monsters coming up right now. All of them have the attrition or the burst damage to take out Seraphon, in my opinion, or Star Starborn specifically. Mm -hmm. Okay, I get that. And the last one, its cousin Coalesce. This is gonna be a doozy because the thing about Coalesce is. It's the more it's the tankier version of Seraphon, minus one damage to specific units. The gorgeous new Croxigor sculpts. 
the the really good source warriors that have come out. I can see uh, people, more people picking up Coalesce. I just don't think it's as strong as Starborn because it has less options. Mm. I would actually put them. I put them here for now. Oh, really? Even below Nurgle? Huh? Um, I will put them below Nurgle because they have a lot of damage, monsters, actions, and, and cheese. But. I, I don't see it yet. I don't see them out fighting everyone else. Agrodon, right? Agrodon Lancers are cool. Anything on a Karn store is cool in my book, but it is not exactly... Is Coalesce the one with um, that focuses on uh, empowering on, your... Um, what do you call this? Empowering your Carnosaurs? The one that gives you... Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, okay. So it makes the melee combat a lot more reliable, but only time will tell if this tier list is going to end up being cringe in a few years. <laughs> but yeah, um, you have anything against Coalesce being here? No, I, I, I haven't actually finished right. reading their book. Okay, let's look at the, the let's look at this right. Let's look at this tier list. Anything feel out of place for you? Uh... I'll tell you one that, it... boom. <laughs> I'll put it in 05. No one wants to play it. Oh, I think it doesn't have any good matchups. It used to be God, the the best Orc War Clan out there, but now it's it's here. Yeah. I put it in 05. If you go join with a Bone Flare tournament, get ready to have fun and be uh, uh, detached from the outcome. I think OBR. Oh, I think OBR should be above Beast of Chaos, for me at least. Oh no, I'm trying to think if they should be above uh, Slanesh. Um, with people figuring out how to use Temptation Dice, I think the answer is yes. Do you think they, they, do you think they can score easily score a 4-1 with uh, um, if they, If the Slanesh players have a good way to come up with Depravity, I would put Slanesh over OBR. But I think OBR right now is solid. You just It's just really hard to play. That's something I find in common with a lot of the books. I think the books that came out the past six months have a higher uh, difficulty curve. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. I think having, yeah, with the new book, so yeah, ha, ha, with the new book coming, uh, new books coming out, you certain certain definitely see a pattern of uh, difficulty as well. But it rewards you with a better chance of. Uh, winning your games because of the new yeah. mechanic they, they try to input to the game and seeing how it fits with the overall uh, meta with uh, Age of Sigmar okay but yeah I, I completely agree we're up for an, um, as of right now we don't know squat about the the new season but this is what we have and this is what we think the, the tiers for AOS looks like do you have uh, you want you have anything else you want to add, Pat? Uh, no, I think I think that's all of it. All right. So, thank if you've lasted, you know, if you've stuck around for this long, thank you so much for hanging out with us. If you like more content like this and you want to hear more about the the scene in Manila or our thoughts about Age of Sigmar's meta or or anything else really, feel free to give us a sub, hit the icon, and hit the real icon after that, and give us a comment. Uh, drop us a comment if you want to be part of the conversation we're very active in our YouTube channel and we also want to have open a discourse do you think that we're idiots for hearing it the way it is or do you agree you know like let us know yeah so yeah if you like it uh, hit the like button uh, subscribe if you want to see more content we're definitely trying to have more content coming out and hopefully with the new season coming out will be a lot more active especially with battle reports so that's what we're hoping for yeah so, it's so hard to just it's hard to make and edit them but we do want to do more yeah we definitely want to do more so yeah. but yeah i think that should be all for the night right pat yeah all right thank you everyone for joining us have a good evening and may you roll really high in your next games good right. night night